Hi, I'm Dr. Sharon Cermak. I'm a professor of occupational therapy and occupational science at the University of Southern California, and also a professor of pediatrics at the USC Keck School of Medicine. And I'm pleased to be part of the Simon Searchlight Group and be able to talk about different re recognizing anxiety behaviors and using calming strategies. Um, what I will be doing is linking both anxiety and sensory processing in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. <clears throat> the purpose of the presentation is to understand how sensory factors can both contribute to increasing or decreasing anxiety and to understand how to use sensory strategies to optimize regulation and children's performance. Sensory integration is a way of understanding behavior and it's also an approach to intervention. The theory on which sensory integration is based was first introduced by Dr. A. G. Nairs as, quote, the neurological process that organizes sensation from one's own body and from the environment and makes it possible to use the body effectively within the environment. So here we have the ability to interact with the environment is dependent on the processing of information that we receive from our senses. Sensory integration treatment is designed to help children with sensory integration dysfunction to change how the brain processes and organizes sensory information. So the goal of sensory integration as an intervention does not focus on teaching specific skills such as handwriting, but rather it focuses on building the foundation skills necessary to enable the child to learn handwriting and to learn other, other skills. So it's foundation building of processing sensory information. And it's important for emotional regulation, behavioral regulation, and to enable the child or individual to motor plan and interact with the environment. And this contrasts with a behavioral approach such as ABA, which is more involved in specific skill building um, and reducing negative behaviors and promoting positive behaviors. There are several different types of sensory integration problems, and I will be talking specifically about one type of problem known as sensory over-responsivity, where the child has difficulty grading the degree intensity and nature of their response to sensory input. Sensory over-responsivity, also called sensory sensitivity, sensory hyper-responsivity, sensory defensiveness, is an overreaction to certain types of stimuli. And these certain types include things like high-pitched sounds, bright lights, food textures, light touch, so stimuli that are typically not noxious to most people for children who have sensory defensiveness or sensory over-responsiveness, these stimuli are experienced as aversive, harmful, and painful. And the individual may respond with fear, avoidance, distraction, or aggression, or even over-awareness where the child becomes really um, so aware of his environment. With most um, individuals with repeated sensory stimulation of the same thing, they will habituate. In other words, they'll get used to the stimulation. So if a child is listening to the child next to him writing on a piece of paper with a pen and it's getting no and it's the scratching is is sort of noisy, most children will get used to it, and that's called habituation. But children who have sensory over responsivity don't habituate as readily as typical children. So it continues to bother them. Um, sensory over-responsivity impedes daily activities, affects academic skills and social participation, and is closely linked to social emotional problems, anxiety, and depression. So sensory over-responsivity and anxiety often are seen together in children with neurodevelopmental disabilities. And the question has been raised, which comes first, anxiety or sensory? Um, it's sort of the chicken or the egg problem. And the reality is that they are cyclical. So 
Sensory issues can cause anxiety in children when they're not comfortable and not feeling comfortable. And anxiety can cause a child to be more aware of their environment and more reflective of their environment. And it can um, both can increase the functional impairment in children and both will interact with each other, sensory and anxiety. We can use sensory stimuli to help the child regulate his arousal level. And you see this all the time with young babies where babies are wrapped in blankets and they're, um, they're cuddled and, and they're firmly wrapped. And that provides deep pressure for the child, which is calming and, or organizing. With children, we frequently will see games played where children are having difficulty with sensory over arousal, where they may be, we may play a game of hot dog where the child would get wrapped in a blanket and then we'd pretend to put mustard on and ketchup on and provide deep pressure that way. Or we can use a weighted blanket, which can also provide deep pressure. Other stimuli that we know are also calming and organizing might include slow, gentle rocking and proprioceptive input to muscles and joints. So something like a child jumping on a trampoline, while it seems like it would be exciting, which it is, it's also very organizing. Um, other things are music, singing, whispering, are all things that can be used to help a child regulate their arousal. I'd like to give you an example of a child experiencing sensory overreactivity during oral care. And I'm choosing oral care as an example because I know that I've talked to many families where brushing their child's teeth, um, taking their child to the dentist is a major, major issue. And you'll, you'll see that in this little boy, with this little boy. And then when we talk about strategies that can be used, we'll talk about strategies that are aimed at the person, the environment, and the occupation. We call that the PEO. And the person would be things to do to change the person. That might be making them less sensory defensive. Things to do to change the environment and things to do to change the task or the occupation. So those are the different ways we'll be looking at helping children to self-regulate and regulate. Teeth, okay? Benjamin, we're gonna brush teeth. Come on, mama. Let's brush our teeth. Let's brush our teeth. Come on. Come on. We're gonna brush our teeth, okay? You have to brush teeth. You have to go to sleep. Brush teeth, Benjamin. We're gonna brush our teeth, okay? You can do it. You're a big boy. Big boy, brush teeth. Brush teeth, Benjamin. Okay, mommy's gonna help then. Okay, mommy's gonna help. Come on. You can do it, sweetie. Help mama. Brush me, brush me, mama. Brush me, brush me, mama. give that mom a tremendous amount of credit for what, she's do, what she was doing and the way she was working with her son. That was just a regular evening routine that we asked her to videotape 
to show what toothbrushing is like in the evenings. And um, she, there were a couple of strategies that I saw her use that I don't even know that she was aware of using that were very calming for the child and that helped him perform a little bit better. And one was her singing. When she started singing, he calmed down. When the water started running, he calmed down. And when she was holding him in a way that was providing deep pressure and circling her arm around him, it was, it was able to help him contain his behavior. Um, and so these are some strategies that we would think about when we're working with that mom to really point out, this is what you're doing and this looks like it's really helpful. Um, this is the next video shows a child going for a dental visit for a regular dental cleaning. And we find that many parents of children with special needs report having, a, having difficulty finding a dentist who's willing to treat their child. And behavior problems are the greatest barriers for dentists' willingness to treat children. Parents often report that their child's sensory issues increase at the dentist and result in increased behavior problems. And these hypersensitivities can lead to a fight, flight, or fright reaction. The child may physically withdraw, may have vocal outbursts, may show aggressive behaviors, um, and attempt to block the stimuli. And as a result, many parents are reluctant to take their children to the dentist because of the challenges that they experience. Um, and many dentists are unwilling to work with children. So this is a, a young boy with autism at having a regular dental cleaning. Everybody was So you can see how challenging that was for that young boy. So when we, um, one of the things that we've been doing is working with the dental clinic at Children's Hospital to adapt the sensory characteristics of the dental environment as a way of um, looking at, can we facilitate oral care for children with developmental disabilities? And again, we're using this model, PEO model of occupational performance where we are working with the environment and focusing on the environment and saying, if we can provide a better environment, it will make a better match between what the child is able to do and the task that has to happen. And we're using a couple of different theory, theoretical perspectives. We're using sensory integration and we're using multi-sensory environments. So these are some of the sensory adaptations that we've made to the dental clinic. Um, we've modified the treatment room in terms of the sensory characteristics. We've changed the lighting, the overhead projector. We have an overhead projector that projects uh, visuals onto the ceiling. The dentist uses a headlamp instead of the bright lights that shine in the child's face. Um, we play nature music and we have a butterfly vest that provides deep touch pressure. So as the child is lying back in the chair and, and we're using a darkened room, he can look up at the ceiling and see these um, moving balls. We also have swimming fish and the child can choose between 
which he wants or the parent can choose which she thinks her child would prefer. This is our weighted butterfly. This is our butterfly vest and it is on the dental chair. It was originally developed in Israel uh, by an occupational therapist working with the dentist. And um, what happens is the child comes and sits in the chair and the butterfly vest, we, then we put a, um, an x-ray bib on the child because it provides deep pressure and some weight, which is calming. And then the child is wrapped up in a cocoon. Um, and we, what we say is that the butterfly is giving the child a hug. And this is much more acceptable to both parents and um, children than the actual, you know, the papoose board. This shows that same little boy again, who you saw earlier um, in, in our uh, participating in our research. The sound of Legos crashing to the floor doesn't seem to bother nine-year-old Sir Warren, but something else does. I don't like that drill. The grating noise of dental tools in his mouth sent Sir, who's on the autism spectrum, into panic mode. It's difficult to watch and heartbreaking for his mother, Danita, who had to hold Sir down during cleaning. It really hurt. It hurt to see my son suffer. You've been losing some teeth, huh? Uh -huh. You had the tooth fairy come by? Uh-huh. A sensory adapted dental environment like this may help. It's a collaboration between the University of Southern California and Children's Hospital Los Angeles. What we're trying to do is basically eliminate some of the triggers that we know can lead to adverse behavior in child with autism. Lights are dimmed, soothing music is played, and slow moving visuals are projected onto the ceiling. Some kids are comforted by a special seat cover called a butterfly that wraps them in a deep pressure hug. Researchers tested the soothing environment in a small study of 44 children, half with autism. So far, the children are showing less behavioral distress. We're seeing that with both typical children and children with autism spectrum disorders. The environment could be adapted for children who have different sensory problems, even otherwise healthy kids like Jake Kirshen. He simply doesn't like going to the dentist. I was looking at the bubbles and it just kind of relaxed me and made me not feel as stress out. The changes also worked for Sir, clearly calmer in the adapted environment. Erica Edwards, NBC News. So although I'm focusing on here um, the dental environment and oral care, much of what I'm saying can also be used and, and thought about for other aspects of daily activities. So for example, feeding and meal times, um, sleep routines, and other activities that the, in which the child is participating. So some of the strategies that can be used in the home by families to help children with autism or other developmental disabilities include consulting with, with the child's occupational therapist or behavior therapist, because those are the disciplines that are most frequently helpful in terms of the behavioral issues. Think about positioning the child. Um, and you saw that one mom providing deep pressure and, uh, and con containing the child. Um, think about the location of the toothbrushing. It doesn't have to be in the bathroom. If a child is really um, calmed by watching videos, one could do the toothbrushing in the living room while the iPad is on. Um, other, act other options would be including modeling toothbrushing, using a mirror, practicing on a doll or a puppet, exploring the brush, um, and making brushing into a game. So this shows exploring the toothbrush.
Other strategies that we can look at for the child will be helping to lessen their dislike and the feeling of a toothbrush in their mouth, maybe starting with an oral massage, using a washcloth on their teeth before a toothbrush, trying toothbrushes with soft or hard bristles, allowing the child to brush his face or lips with the toothbrush, and maybe trying an electric toothbrush. So these would be all different ways or strategies that one could use to help make the sensory aversions to help reduce them. Um, also think about experimenting with different toothpastes, mild, the taste, the smell. And again, similar strategies can be used for feeding challenges, for sleep issues and for other activities. Choosing tools when you're working with, when you're working with tooth, tooth brushing, um, or it could be for meals using friendly spoons, using friendly forks, using equipment that have characters on it. Um, think about using flavored toothpaste in which toothpaste the child will like best. And then some activities that we can use also to help children to get used to these sorts of things would be helping the child learn to brush. And this would be, this is an egg carton and we typically will put marks on it and have the child brush, the, brush them off and clean the teeth just like teeth. And this is a Lego block with clay in between, Play-Doh in between, and the child's using a string to try to get the Play-Doh out. Um, one can use stories that are also very helpful before going to the dentist or before ha having these activities at home. So in this particular um, story, it's called a sensory story because the child is taught sensory strategies that he can use. So to get my mouth and teeth ready, I can bite down firmly, then I press my lips together really hard. I can press my hand firmly against my mouth. So this strategy is actually providing deep pressure that a child can do himself when he goes to the dentist. Music can also be used to go with tooth brushing and there are a number of songs that are available on YouTube. Brush your teeth up and down. Brush your teeth round and round. Brush your teeth from left to right. Brush your teeth in the morning and night. Brush, brush, brush. Brush, brush, brush. Brush your teeth in the morning and night. So the goals of intervention are reframing, increasing individual's awareness of the child's sensory needs and helping others to understand, um, toning down or tempering the central nervous system's responsiveness to sensory input so that the child isn't so distressed. And here we're talking about both adapting the sensory environment and hands-on direct intervention that might be helpful for the child to help him better able to process sensory information. Thank you so much for having me and I'd be happy to enter, to respond and talk about any questions that you may have. Thank you. So welcome everybody to the Recognizing Anxiety Behaviors and Calming Strategies Q&A. I am Leanne Green Snyder, Clinical Research Scientist for Simon Searchlight. And I'm joined here by Dr. Sharon Cermak, who just gave a wonderful presentation to us. Thank you, Dr. Cermak, for that very Thank insightful you. presentation. Yes, thanks. So for this Q&A session, um, I think we've described before, we cannot see or hear you all in the audience, but we ask that you 
um, please ask your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will try to get to them all. Uh, just a reminder, please don't include personal health information just to protect your own privacy. And we do have a lot of different genetic conditions represented here, um, a lot of families. And so we might not be able to answer questions that are super specific to particular genetic groups or to your specific child. So we might um, try to um, model questions so that um, everybody, can, everybody can relate. Okay, so let's get started. We'll begin with our first question. So um, Dr. Cermak, we have a question here about um, uh, uh, parents conveying that certain places seem to increase anxiety in particular, such as being at school. And they're asking, is there anything that can be done to help anxiety behaviors with, with calming techniques in those places where they, as a parent, do not have direct control over the environment? What would you there, say to that? There are some um, things that, that have been used in classrooms that children have found helpful in reducing anxiety and that teachers have found helpful in reducing anxiety behavior. One of the, many of these provide deep pressure. Um, so one of them would be a weighted, a weighted vest. Another would be a weighted blanket that could go over the child's lap. Um, other things that may be helpful are fidget um, things. So a, a stretch band across the, the child's, the two legs of the child's chair that the child can push on with his legs. Um, some, sometimes um, a seat cushion that the child can bounce a little bit on so that they can get a little bit of wiggle and movement in. So many of these things are helpful and calming for children. That's great, great suggestions. And on that note, another parent asks, that butterfly wrap at the dentist office looks amazing. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. And so they ask, where can dentists or parents find these butterfly wraps? Um, that butterfly wrap was made specifically for this research study. We are going to be talking to a company uh, that makes sensory integration equipment to see if they are interested in marketing it. Um, but the other option would be to use a simple x-ray bib because that provides the same kind of pressure and follow it with a weighted blanket. Um, for a very small child, you wouldn't use both. You would just use a weighted blanket that, sh that and weighted blankets should be between five and 10% of the child's weight. And weighted, weighted blankets are commercially available. I know that you can get them through Etsy, E-T-S-Y, as well as other places. Okay, great. And here we have a question. Um, the parent says, curious to hear what you have to say about addressing repetitive behaviors. Do you have any advice? Um, I would say, think about why the child is doing the repetitive behavior. Sometimes it's because their nervous systems need more stimulation and they're bored. Other times it's because they're anxious and it's a way of reducing their anxiety. Um, and so, helping to understand why that behavior is occurring is often helpful. And then asking the question afterwards, is it interfering with my child's learning and or functioning? And if it's not interfering, um, it may not be something you necessarily want to address or want to get rid of or need to get rid of. If it is interfering, then looking for what are called functionally equivalent alternative behaviors, F-E-A-P, um, which would be something that the child can do that is providing the same sort of input, but um, is, is more acceptable and less interfering with what the child needs to do and wants to do. That's a really good point that you raise. I appreciate that, Dr. Cermak, um, uh, in terms of being sensitive to how um, repetitive behaviors are not always problematic. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you saying that. Um, this is a tricky question. How would I perhaps differentiate behavior due to a syndrome? Okay, so due to the child's uh, genetic condition um, and differentiate that from behavior that is just due to their personality. Um, and then I would add to that, 
I, I would be curious of then differentiate that from a particular problem behavior, you know, that might be reacting to the environment. And mm -hmm. then um, the parent asks, that said, does it even matter what causes it? Or should we just focus on just focus on the behavior? Well, I think it does matter what causes it because your response to the behavior would be very different. So if there is something um, that is overwhelming in the environment that is really producing a lot of anxiety, the child's behavior would reflect that anxiety. And what you would want to do is address the whatever it is that's causing the anxiety to begin with. Rather than just focusing on the behavior, you'd want to focus on what is it that's causing the behavior. Uh, within occupational therapy, we use a very simple model that's called PEO, the person, the environment, and the occupation, which is basically the same as the activity. And we say performance is optimal when there is a good match between the environment, the task or occupation, and the child's ability. And so if things are not working well, what can you do to make a better match? What can you make do to make those PEO circles overlap better? And sometimes it's changing the child and that might be providing intervention and enabling the child to do, giving them speech and language skills and speech and language therapy, a communication board. So those would be things that, will, that might change or affect the child's ability. Another would be to change the task. So instead of making the child handwrite um, giving him an audio recorder. So that would be changing the task. And the other thing would be changing the environment. And that would be examples of that are what we did at the dentist's office, where we changed the sensory characteristics of the dentist's office to reduce anxiety. We didn't change the child's permanent biological or psychophysiological makeup, but we actually made a better match between what he was able to handle and what the requirements of the environment are. So I tend to think of everything in terms of PEO. Can we affect the child this way, that way, or the other way? And it sounds like Dr. Cermak that, um, you know, why we, while we might not be able to say we can differentiate a, a behavior due to a particular condition or, or a, you know, a character trait or personality, mm -hmm. that there, um, there are these um, different aspects of what you say, the PEO, that um, are, they are addressable, they are modifiable, and that we can look for ways, um, regardless of how we interpret them, to, to address them, to try to address Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very, very helpful. Um, okay. Do you have any ideas for how to continue with a sensory diet for kids as they reach adolescence? And they're starting to outgrow the more play-based strategies that worked well when they were younger. Um, there are some strategies that I, I think that you're, you're right in that it's very important to look at the child's developmental level as they get older and things that were appropriate for, for a young child may no longer be appropriate. Um, they may be providing the correct type of input, but the, the materials and the objects may be too childlike. And so that one definitely needs to take into account the age appropriateness of, of um, the types of activities. I think um, for older children, um, many of the same, some of the same activities can be incorporated, but just within different contexts. So changing the environment, so to speak, in which it's not a preschool playground, but it may be um, activities that are more, um, appropriate for a child's developmental age. Okay, and on that note, um, we had a comment that, um, you know, as kids grow up, um, they may be extremely anxious adults. And um, then, you know, then what do you do when you know, the sensory, um, sensory um, interventions that might've worked when they're, they're young don't work anymore. And so, uh, specific questions, a good companion to that is what sorts of sensory adaptations are appropriate for adults? Um, and so can you give some examples? So you talked about how we might um, change things up for, 
adults or for teens. Mm-hmm. Can you give some examples? So using a weighted blanket might be an example. Um, and if a child is having, an, or an adolescent is having difficulty falling asleep, using a weighted blanket that they can, um, that would provide deep pressure would be an example of, of an adaptation that could be used. Um, even using things like weighted vests or um, a, a something a, a lap, something on the lap to provide some deep pressure could be used with older individuals as well. Oops. Okay. Very good, very helpful. Well, I think we are going to wrap up. We're gonna try to wrap up a minute early here so that we have enough time um, before we move in um, uh, to our our next uh, step here. So I wanna thank everyone for joining this Q&A. We hope that you learned some valuable information today. And thank you, Dr. Cermak, so much for your presentation and for participating in today's Q&A. It's my Um, pleasure to be part of the group. And thank you for having me. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to everyone here joining us in next week's sessions. Thank you all. And I wish the best to all the families.